Okay, Todd DeSorbo, welcome to the podcast, mate. How are you? Yeah, man. Thanks. Appreciate it. Glad to be here. I'm good. What are you doing with this background? I was expecting a beach in the Caribbean. What, what are you doing, man? <laughs> no, there's no rest for the weary, man. <laughs> Serious? I mean, come on. Yeah. You, got, you got to have some days off, right? Right back at it. I, I'm actually take next my children, my kids spring break is next week. So uh-huh. I, we're going to go to Florida for the week and get yeah. out of Dodge for a few days. Good, good idea, man. Because it'll it'll yeah. burn you up quick. Um, going, <laughs> going back to back like that. So, yeah. well, listen, hey, congratulations on a great season, man. Yeah, thanks. Appreciate it. It was fun. Yeah, I mean, um, you, you've you've spent some time talking about the women. I've seen some of that, and, and we can go over that a little bit too. But just uh, in terms of the men's meet, you just come off that. So, how was that whole experience? It was good. Um, obviously, you know, it's really different <laughs> coming yeah. off the women's meet and going into the men's meet and. Um, it was just funny. I was talking to some of our coaches, Wes Foltz, you know, the day before the men's meet started and I was like, man, I, I feel significantly less stress and pressure right now than I did going into the last week, you know? Um, so, you know, that it was fun to ne- not necessarily have, I mean, I think being in a position when you can win is obviously fun and you want to be in that position as often as you can be. And, um, that, that stress and pressure is welcomed certainly, but, um, you know, just, I, I, I just, person didn't feel it as much going into the men's meet just because we didn't have that you know pressure of potentially winning um we have the pressure of trying to perform really well and and exceed expectations and beat our seat times and that type of stuff um but you know i think that's the, all that is maybe a little bit easier than the expectation of winning but um yeah i mean the men's meet was fantastic you know i think that the guys swam really well we're we're super young um you know i think two thirds or three quarters of our conference team was freshmen or sophomores. Uh, we only have, I think five or six seniors on the team, um, mm-hmm. sorry, five or six juniors and seniors on the team. So, um, you know, I, I was pretty impressed with how the young guys swam and our older guys too. We had a senior just light it up, um, Kiefer Barnum in the brushstrokes, which was a lot of fun to see. So, you know, they, they perform really well. Um, you know, I think they, you know, I think they're trying to prove themselves and, they, and they've got a little bit of chip on their shoulder. So, you know, they, they did a really good job. Yeah. Well, good stuff, man. Congrats on that. Uh, look, this is your fourth season there. Is that right? Yeah. And, yep. and, and obviously last year you, you guys had to sit and, and, and not compete in season. That was, that was awful for everybody. So I don't yeah. know if we really call that a season fully, but um, so you've been there a little while. What is it about the school itself, Virginia, that when you looked at it and you looked at the job, you thought to yourself, we can win there. What, what is it that you saw that maybe other people weren't getting? Um, you know, I, well, first of all, you know, obviously I was at NC State. So, you know, I coached six years across the pool deck from Virginia. So I got to know, you know, enough about the university itself, enough mm-hmm. about the program to know that, you know, there's a great tradition and, and there's a lot of potential here. And, you know, just, I guess when I really looked, dug deeper into it before I took the position, you know, I started formulating the uh, conclusion that Ca- uh, Virginia, University of Virginia, just generally speaking, is a lot like Cal Berkeley. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it's kind of like a sister university. It's really highly ranked. It's a public university. There's a lot of similarities between the two, just the schools, generally speaking. And, you know, so in my mind, I was like, all right, you know, Virginia is a lot like Cal. Cal contends for national titles every year on the men and the women's side. So there's no reason why Virginia, you know, shouldn't be able to do that as well. Um, I think obviously with a lot of elbow grease, you know, and the right staff and buy-in from the athletes and, you know, if things go well, we should be able to, you know, get to that, that place. Um, And, you know, you know, personally, professionally for me, I, you know, we were doing great things at NC state. They still are. Um, you know, I had a blast there. Uh, you know, I, I had a lot of great experiences, you know, kind of culminating at the end tail end of my time there with Ryan held making the Olympic team and, and an Olympic gold medal. And, and I was in Rio, you know? And so for me at that point, I was like, I want, I was for my career. I was like, I just want to continue to, you know, coach national champions. I want to continue to try to put people on Olympic teams. And so, you know, I don't think I would have, I would have never have left where I was um, if I didn't think Virginia had the possibility, you know, to be able to do those types of things. Yeah, absolutely. I, I didn't know that I would be where we are today. <laughs> yeah. Know, well, listen, you've, later, you've moved but... fast, man. You've moved, you've moved real fast. 
Yeah, I'm not, I don't know if that's a good thing or bad thing. Now there's all these <laughs> expectations, you know. Like, <laughs> well, look, you talked about pressure early, and I think there's pressure all the way along the the road, right? Like where you're at, you no one's happy where you're at. And then until you get to where you want to be, and then all of a sudden it's like, okay, you did that once, now go do it again. It's like, oh wow, like I got to do all that again. Um, yeah. And then it's like, you know, let's not let's hope we don't fall backwards. And and so there's there's just pressure up and down the line for all the coaches. So I I empathize, yeah. man. I've I've seen it. I've been there. Um, in terms of this, you know, I had I had assistant coaches that would come to me at Auburn and say, hey, I'm I'm looking at this head coaching position. And and for me, in my mind, it'd be like, all right, you're either yeah, you're absolutely ready for that. It's time. Or, hey, you know, just hold off a little bit long. You need a little bit more experience. How did you know it was time for you to move on and, and take over as head coach? You know, I really didn't know. Um, you know, I, I the last maybe two years at NC State, I, a lot of people asked me, you know, do you want to be a head coach? Are you looking, you know, how long – recruits obviously are asking, how long are you going to be here? Mm. You know, I, I really – have never had at that point I never really had the whole like you know I, I didn't have the urge and desire to go be a head coach you know I wasn't like I could have been fine staying there forever and being the Chris Kubik to Braden Holloway you know yeah. like, like Chris was to Eddie um, and and I think that's how Braden and I worked really well together and potentially could have continued on you know that way so you know I, I never really was like I'm ready for this or, uh, you know, I'm looking for this. Um, to me, it's just, you know, situational. And I really didn't start thinking about that until the opportunity came up and, and I moved further in the process and like, okay, start talking to my wife about, all right, I might get an offer on this position. Yeah. Do we want to go? Am I ready for it? You know? And, and so really at that point it was like, yeah, I think I'm ready for it. I can handle it. And, um, I don't know if you're ever, I don't know that I was ready for it. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know that anybody's ever ready for it mm -hmm. because you, you know, until you get into it, you know, you know, until you get into this uh, head position is really different than an assistant coaching position, even in an associate head coaching position, because yeah. at the end of the day, it's, it's, you know, until you're a head coach, it's not the, your, your responsibilities are significantly less than being the head coach. Cause then you have all the responsibility, whether you're making the decisions or not, everything lies on your shoulder. So I don't know if anybody's ever really ready for it because I don't think you really know what you're getting into until you get into it. And you're like, Oh boy, what do I do with this one? Yeah. <laughs> you know? No, so. I agree, man. It's tough. And, and uh, that was, that's kind of my next question for you is like, what, what are the things that surprise you? Because, you know, when you're an assistant coach, you're a coach and, and, and you get a lot of duties. And when, you, when you become the head coach, for me, all of a sudden I was really a manager, you know, you're managing stuff, you're managing, um, a, you know, a group of 60 athletes for you, you got a men's and women's team. Now you've also got pros, you're managing pros as well. So it's like, there's a lot of people you're managing. Um, did you find that as well, that there's a management component to it? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. hundred percent. Um, you know, as, as an associate head or assistant coach, you, you, I, at least for me, was fortunate enough to just, just do the things I really like to do, which was yeah. recruit and coach. I didn't yeah. have to do any paperwork or, you know, operation stuff or anything like that. And then obviously you get into this role. And um, I think a lot of head coaches, uh, you know, their roles as a coach and as a recruiter might be diminished a little bit because of all the other responsibilities that we have, you know, for me. So, yeah. So, yeah, obviously I have to do, there is a lot of management in this. So you have to manage, you know, a, a lot of athletes, you got to manage your coaching staff, you know, compliance and, you know, recruiting and everything else, you know, but personally for me, I, what I enjoy about coaching, like I was a CPA for, I don't know, seven or eight years doing tax consulting work. And I switched out of oh. that to go be a coach because okay. I love coaching. Mm. So the last thing I ever want to do is allow that, the things that I love about why I do this job to be diminished and, and not, um, you know, and have other things take away from it. So, you know, I coach as much, if not more than I've ever coached and I recruit as much, if not more than I've ever recruited, but those are the things I love to do. So I'm going to keep doing those, even if that means I got to work, you know, overtime, double overtime, triple overtime to get all the other stuff that I got to get done um, as well. But fortunately, I also have a really good staff that takes on a lot of load of um, a lot of other things that I might have to do. Obviously, there's things that I have to do that nobody else can do that I have like, that's yeah. just my requirement, I have to do it. Um, but anything that I don't that doesn't necessarily have to come directly from me. My staff picks up a lot of that load and really helps out with it. So that allows me to stay on the deck and to be able to recruit. 
So as, as a former CPA, you could manage the scholarship numbers. That was, that was new for me as the head coach. So like, <laughs> yeah, you got to deal with this now. I'm like, oh, wow, this is different. I got to chop scholarships <laughs> up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's tough. I'm, a, I'm definitely a numbers guy. So that, that kind of stuff is not too challenging for me. Yeah. Um, what about it just in terms of, um, you know, balancing? I mean, balance is such, it's not the right word because you're never going to have balance, but how do you, how do you manage being a dad and being a husband and, and, um, and putting that into, you know, managing this huge juggernaut that you're dealing with? Yeah, that, that it's all, you know, it, it's a challenge. That's for sure. Um, you know, I think that it's, I, there's a lot of times where I would love to you know, I just remember the days before I had children when I would come home from work or practice in the afternoon and literally veg on the couch for two hours yeah. and watch TV or just hang out with my wife and, and we would do nothing and, and I'd relax. Because coaching, you know, at least if, you, if, you're, if you're intense about it and you're really into it mm-hmm. and, you know, you get into the workouts and you're energetic, it takes a lot out of you, you yeah. know. And so at the end of the day, I'm ready to go pass out. And now, obviously, with two children, you, you can't do that. So yeah. um, I guess I've just got, kind of gotten used to not sleeping as much, <laughs> not <laughs> resting as much, um, you know, spend as much time with them as possible, you know, at home, um, schedule recruiting calls for a little bit later at night when they're already in bed, um, try to get as many recruiting calls done during the day as possible if we can while they're at school, yeah. you know, and, and, you know, do my best once practice is over on Saturday to shut the phone off and spend the rest of the day Saturday and as much of Sunday as possible with them. And, you know, um, you know, so it's definitely challenging and, you know, but like, it's a, um, it's, it's a challenge. It's not like it's a challenge that you have to like force really, you know, it's just, you just, I think every coach and I'm, you know, I'm one of those two that's always on my phone and always responding to text messages and always contacting Mm -hmm. people. And so, you know, it's my challenge is just putting my phone away and let go, letting it be and stepping, you know, 30 feet away or going outside with the kids and just letting it be and knowing that, you know, whatever is going to co- pop up in the next couple hours can wait a couple hours. And the family's is, you know, at the end of the day, the family's the most important thing. Yeah, for sure. And, and that'll add up over time. So that'll be important and, and, and learning to put the phone away. One of the things my, my um, former wife used to tell me uh, was to leave the phone in the car for a couple of hours. As soon as I got home, just like leave it there, come inside, be with the kids, be with the family, eat dinner with us. And then, you know, once you put them to bed, you go back outside, pick the phone up and, and start doing recruiting calls and that sort of thing. Yeah. Look, there's no, there's no simple answer to that. It's tough, but um, yeah. Yeah. Well, let's be honest then. Let, let's try and do an honest assessment. How have you had so much success in such a short time? Like, what have you done really well? Give yourself, give yourself some credit yourself, give your staff some credit. I mean, what, what have you guys done really well in order to have this success in, in this short time? Well, I think the best thing I ever did was hire the people that I hired. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't be, it was funny cause I was actually talking to my sport administrator this morning about my staff and, you know, it was, we were just reminiscing about four years ago when I started and I, after I was hired talking to him about who I wanted to hire and who I hoped to get. And then not only that, but who that I hoped that those coaches, it worked out really well with those coaches because I knew Wes Fultz really well. Cause I worked with him at NC state for, for several years. Um, I knew of Tyler, but I didn't really know him. Um, I knew of Blair Bachman, but I didn't really know her. Um, You know, and so, you know, it's like you're hiring these people, but you don't necessarily know exactly how they're going to mold or mesh with you, um, with the kids. You know, you hope that it turns out really well. Um, So been really fortunate from that perspective that it obviously has worked out really, really well. So I, I think that that's probably the best thing that, you know, I ever did. And, and maybe it was just entirely luck. I don't know. But, um, you know, they, they've done an unreal job. You know, um, Tyler obviously has a great, uh, you know, he, he just he's just well known. and He's got a, a great history of coaching great athletes, mm-hmm. um, you know, and, and so he was kind of easy to try to bring in when I first got here. Wes has really come into his own, especially, you know, this year he's coached some athletes that have done this year, especially done some tremendous things. And he's a young guy, but he's really, I think, blossoming, you know, over the last couple of years. And like I said, especially this year, and Blair is just, Blair's honestly done an unreal job since she got here. Um, You know, she's, she coached Paige Madden to three NCAA titles this year. She coached Alex Walsh to an NCAA title, um, you know, and among, you know, a lot of other great uh, athletes. So, it's just it, the, the staff has been the best thing that's happened to me, um, you know, and, and to the program. So um, outside of that, I mean, I think we just I think we just work really hard. 
Um, you know, I think our staff works really hard at recruiting. Uh, I think, you know, we put a ton of time and energy into those types of things. Um, you know, I think the staff spends a ton of time, works really hard at trying to develop programs for individuals. You know, we get very specific training wise with individuals. So there's not this cookie cutter. Everybody is doing the same thing. You know, there's, there's probably, you know, there's, 50 swimmers on our team and there's probably 35 different programs um, because mm -hmm. they all, they all need different things, which creates a lot more work. Um, but I think you get, you get more out of your athletes when they have more specifically what they need. Um, you know, and so the staff works really hard at, at putting those things together, thinking about what people need to get better year to year. And, and then I think, you know, probably the best thing that I, I think I've done, I don't know, um, is just, created a great environment for our staff to just to have a good time and enjoy themselves and have fun. And we get along really well. Um, you know, we joke nonstop. We're very rarely all that serious. Um, and I, but I think that that, I think that rolls over onto the pool deck. And so the kids, you know, the team sees us walk out of the office laughing and having a good time and hooting and hollering and then, and they get excited and get into it. And so I think that that the environment in our office really just flows out onto the pool deck every day and, and creates, you know, a little bit of electricity out there as well. Um, Cause obviously swimming is a tough sport and you're not, if you're not having fun and enjoying it, it, it's not, you know, it's miserable. So, you know, the, the number one goal is to really keep the kids happy. Um, you know, obviously there's a balance between, you know, keeping, keep people happy and working really hard. Um, but, you know, I think our staff does a really good job of, of that with the team as well. How do you, you talked about that in terms of Paige Madden and, and um, you know, not, not being her go-to coach, you know, for, for everything, right? So how do you balance that between being the head coach and allowing your assistants to coach and form relationships and, and get the swimmers to where they need to be in terms of just your mentality? What's that for you? Yeah. You know, so my, the two coaching jobs I had prior to coming here to Virginia as assist, as an assistant coach, I both times was afforded the opportunity to just have carte blanche, you know, full autonomy with the group. And especially my first job, I learned a lot that way. Like it was the best learning opportunity I could have ever have had. Mm -hmm. And I'm really appreciative to the coach, Dave Allen at UNCW, who had faith in me, I had zero coaching experience. And he was like, take the sprinters and go. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I, I've done that here as well. So, all, you know, all of our coaches have their you know, primary group and they do their thing. Now we, we obviously communicate nonstop. We talk nonstop. Everybody bounces ideas off of each other. Um, you know, but I, I trust them and they do a great job. And so I think that, you know, my trust in them and faith in them, it, you know, I think the kids see that and, and, you know, the athletes see it. And, and so they buy into it as well. Um, you know, but like any of those athletes that those coaches coach primarily, I, you know, I, like we talked about earlier, having to manage 50, you know, or 60 athletes, um, I do my best to just make my, make the rounds and, and stay in contact with them, you know, as much as possible, set up meetings with them periodically, just check with them on the pool deck. Um, it, you know, that, that to me is probably the biggest challenge as a head coach for me yeah. personally, because I also have a primary group of 10 or 15 athletes that I'm coaching. And so when I'm coaching them for two hours, I'm not necessarily, uh, yeah. you know, talking to or watching over the other, you know, 45 athletes. So, um, it's something that I've tried to be better and better and better at. And I think, and I continue to get better at is just, you know, continuing to foster the relationships and, you know, make sure that everybody's doing well. But I, you know, I hope, yeah, I think that we do a, a pretty good job of allowing those athletes to know, even though I'm not your primary coach, I'm here for you. I, you know, I am here to support you page Madden, for example, a hundred percent and whatever you need to be successful, to be happy, you know, to, move on with life post swimming, whatever that may be, you know, Blair is going to coach you primarily. You'll, you know, you may come and swim with me here or there, but you know, Paige, for example, will come and, and, you know, meet with me and ask me questions and bounce ideas off of me, whether it's be swimming related or career related or, or, you know, whatever it might be. Um, so they, they all know that the door is open here, you know, to have conversations with me as well about whatever they might need. Yeah. Um, but but our, but our assistant coaches have really good relationships with the athletes as well to where, you know, you know, those, those athletes go to them significantly more than they even come to me. And, and, you know, cause they have that Avenue as well. And I think it's good because they have, now they have two, if not more, um, you know, resources as, as coaches here to help them out through anything they might need. 
What about the task of balancing between men and women being the head coach for two teams? I mean, it's, it's Virginia, but you know, you've got obviously two different types of groups. Um, is that, how do you, how do you manage that part of it? I mean, we're, you know, we are in, you know, we are 100% um, to the letter combined. So yeah. everything we do is a hundred percent together. So okay. the guys and the girls are in the water training, not together, dry mm-hmm. land together, weight room together. So that makes it a lot easier uh, from that perspective because they're, they're all together all the time. So, you know, most team meetings we have are both groups. Um, you know, we might be, you know, we start splitting them apart in team meetings towards the end of the season when we're prepping for ACCs or NCAAs. Right. Um, but, you know, we pretty much just, they're all they're all we don't really i don't really consider it men and women it's it's just uva swimming and diving yeah yeah that makes sense that's probably the best way to do it otherwise you drive yourself mad but yeah but uh it works it's working um tell me this you guys uh look a couple of years ago i went down to australia and i did a talk on they they wanted to understand this um double peaking periodization right and it's kind of the time between accs and ncaa's and you guys did a phenomenal job this year at accs i think sounds like you went all the way down for it to prepare to give you guys give the girls and guys a chance to swim they haven't you know rested maybe in two years some of them so like let's go all the way down let's race then you go into ncas you're the number one seed in multiple events and then you out swim your seeds which is extremely difficult to do i don't think people understand how tough that is um, but just in terms of just what you know, what you can share, what you've learned, um, what you think is useful. Because like I said, I went down to Australia and they're really interested in taking their trials from six months out of the Olympics to about five weeks out. And they were just trying to take in information. So I, I shared some stuff and you and I can have a conversation. But I just want your opinion on how did you go from ACCs coming all the way down to go on NCAs and swimming even faster? Really tough thing to do. Yeah. Yeah. Um... You know, and, and in a normal year, we, we probably wouldn't do that. Normally, we would swim through ACCs. You know, the people who are qualified for NCAA swim through ACCs and, and really focus on peaking at NCAAs. We did that. So we did. We went all in for ACCs for both the men and the women this year. And we, we really made that decision about maybe six weeks before ACCs. We weren't going to. We were going we to train through ACCs and, and put everything into NCAAs. And then I just – I started questioning whether we were going to have NCAAs. Yeah, um, sure. I, I began to be really confident we were going to have ACCs, but I, I didn't, you know, and there was uncertainty still around NCAAs. And so, you know, we talked to the team and we're like, look, you know, we don't know if we're going to have NCAAs. And I'd hate for, like you said, I'd hate for you to go two years without a taper meet. Paige Madden, for example, didn't get a taper meet last year. Kate yeah. Douglas didn't get a taper meet. You know, a lot of our girls especially didn't taper for ACCs last year, focusing on NCAAs. And I said, look, let's just, let's go all in. And, and then if we have NCAAs, we'll deal with it. We'll figure it out. We can, we can handle it. Um, and, and then, you know, the more, you know, we start thinking about it, you know, we, every year we have people who will, who have tapered for ACCs and then retaper for NCAAs and they've sure. gone there and they've been even faster. Yeah. Um, and so even with our top, our top end athletes, we weren't really too concerned about it because we've been able to do it. Um, and, and honestly, the approach, I don't know that the approach is as much scientific or um, physiological as it is maybe more psychological. Mm. Um, you know, our approach really is, I, well, I learned really early on in my career that if you don't work hard enough between the two meets, the second meet's going to be a disaster. <laughs> okay, right. That that that's I think the number one key. So you um, you you go and, straight back to heavy work, or how long do you take off between well, the meets? We, well, so this year what we do we did, and pro- so we actually did a long course time trial the Wednesday following ACCs for both the men and the women. Okay. So what we did was we we got them back in the weight room right away. We got back to dry land right away on Monday after NCAA after ACC. So they oh, wow. they race Saturday, they have Sunday off. We went right back to it on Monday. We just singled the Monday. We singled on Tuesday. Um, so we usually what we do is Monday, Tuesday, we kind of flush out and we just yeah. did nothing killer. We just do, you know, I don't know, five or six thousand aerobic for everybody just to yeah. flush the meats out. But we get that right back into the weight room and dry land. And then back half of the week, Wednesday, Thursday, we start hammering. Um, so I think we went, I think we singled Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, we doubled Thursday, Friday, and then trained on Saturday. But once we got through Wednesday, we really like Thursday, we started cranking pretty hard. Um, kind of like a, more like a, 
what you know what we call rocktober type training um oh, right. you know all right so you and really then, get into it oh yeah yeah oh, okay. um yeah it's pretty intense you know some people you know higher volume than others but it, it's it's some pretty intense training and we probably did that for for the women we we were probably that high you know on intensity probably for a week and a half to two weeks okay um how long then, do you have in between the meets it's about four weeks is well it? it's four weeks from start to start date to start date. So, okay, right. but really by the time you get done with ACCs, you, that Monday after ACCs, you're, you're leaving three weeks later. Okay. Three weeks. Yeah. So you have, you, you have like three weeks and two days of training to prepare. So you um, smash it for about 10 days of that three weeks is, is hardcore work for about 10 days. Yeah. Okay. And then even the week before, the week before NCAAs is still pretty intense, but we might back down and drop a practice or two. Right. Um, and we're in the weight room all the way through the Friday before NCAAs as well. Do you um, do then, so your second rest, your second full rest would be shorter than your first full rest? Significantly. Okay, sure. Significantly. Um, and some people need less rest than others, obviously, right? Like some people yep. don't need, as, as, you know, some people might need a couple of days, some people might need a week. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I think, and it's really, I think it's really different for the women than it is for the men. So right now I'm more being more specific to the women and I'm happy to discuss the men too. But, um, but I also think that again, the mentality, you know, what we tell our team is you're like, look, this training is going to be really hard. It's going to be really intense. You're going to be really tired, but there's a couple of things you need to understand and, and a couple of, uh, you know, um, psychological approaches that you need to take and, and we're going to take is one you're coming off of taper you're tapered right you're shaved and you're tapered so when we step back in the pool to train that week after you should be able to train at a level higher than you've trained all year because mm. you're resting right you know especially if we come back on monday and tuesday and we flush the meat out you know you're not going to feel you're going to feel pretty bad but you you should be able to you know anything we do so say we go you know for example in October, we do a, we go 20 fifties on two minutes all out mm -hmm. uh, from a push. We do it again between ACCs and NCAAs. And we tell them like, you should be significantly faster right now than you were then, because back then you were broken down, you were tired, you were doing doubles. Yeah. We're doing that now, but you're also shaved and you just, you're tapered. So, you know, we, you know, like we, I was blown away. We did 20 fifties and they were flying. Wow. Uh, and we did that. We did that at the end of the second week. So they had already been doing doubles and cranking and, and we went 20 fifties and for example, Kate Douglas pushed 22, 20 times in a 53. <laughs> um, actually I lied. She went 23 Oh on the first one. And then and I, I was like, Holy cow. I've never seen anybody do that before. We had girls pushing 25s on 20 fifties backstroke and butterfly and girls going 29s on 50 breaststrokes for 20 fifties in a row. So, you know, the, the mentality is you, it's only three weeks. you got to train at a higher level these three weeks than you have the entire year. And if you do that, then your body's just gotten used to being faster than it's been all year. You're, you'll, you'll be able to go to NCAAs and be faster. Yeah. And that's um, where the psychology comes into it too. You know, yeah. they, they see themselves, they hear it, they feel it. It's like, oh yeah, it's, it's working. So that, that's yeah. a good thing. Tell yeah. me this, why'd you pick the two minutes? I mean, intervals, everyone's always funny about their intervals, but why two minutes specifically? I don't know. I, it's just what I, I, I have there aren't, there aren't very many sets that I repeat over the course of a year or even from year to year, but there are maybe five and okay. the 2050 on two minutes is one that I do every single year, always in October. Um, and, and now we do it, you know, between ACCs and NCAAs as well. And, and it's just, um, it's just kind of a number where I feel like, especially for it, it's really geared more towards the sprinters. Yeah. Um, but, but actually this year we are in, I think almost our entire NCAA team did it all together, which was pretty cool too. Cause it was like, you know, a bunch of people just swimming fast and practice and it was a lot of energy and it was yeah. music was pumping. It was fun, but it's just a number that I've used in the past that like, when I think about sprinters, I'm like, all right, minute and a half is going to kill them and they probably aren't going to survive it. <laughs> yeah. You know, two minutes is just enough to get enough recovery to where, you know, I've seen them be able to maintain enough, but get towards the end and start fading a little bit, which is what I want. Like I want them to have gone hard enough to where, the last four or five are going to be their slowest four or five, but there's not this like three second drop off or, or, you know, or it's so bad. They're barely, you know, above water and two minutes seems to be the for sprinters anyway, seems to be a good, a good amount of rest where, you know, it's really, really hard, but they can maintain for 20 fifties. 
Yeah, sounds they, like and, it. And she, can, she's pushing twenty twos. Yeah, but I want them to go really fast too. So yeah. if you did them on a minute or even a minute and a half, they're probably going to be a second, you know, half a second to a second slower. And I, I've always have always been the type of coach that's been like faster is better. So yeah, I got to give you a little bit more rest. I'm gonna give you more rest because I yeah. want, I'd rather you swim really fast in practice than you know than bury you. Yeah, I like that. Are they from a dive or push? Did you say push? push okay 22 yeah. from a push that's impressive <laughs> wow. well you got yeah but you got, it's it's relative though you know my watch is a little fast <laughs> no nah, man look it, 20 <laughs> sh, i can imagine that i look she's fast as it is but 22 is i could see her doing that there's some there's some kids out there that can train too there's people yeah. that can smoke up the training pool yeah. and then transfer that into some racing but um that, that's awesome great to see um it, it does come down to talent too i mean you guys obviously recruit hard and look when you first come into the program there's good kids and they mean well but it it helps to have kids that can perform and, and produce and swim super fast so you guys are recruiting your brains out to get those kids right yeah yeah i mean that you know I think that that's the lifeblood to any success any program is going to have. You've got to you've got to be able to recruit talented athletes, and I mean, you can you know obviously coaching them and developing them. To me, that's the easier part. You know, you, you got to get them in the door first. So, um, you know, we were fortunate when we got here that we had a we had a lot of talent on the team already. Um, you know, like Paige Madden, for example, she was a we didn't recruit her. She was a freshman. You know, her first year was was my first year. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, she was somebody that I tried to recruit when I was at NC state, uh, you know, and we had, there were several of those men and women on our, on the team here at UVA already. So we were fortunate that there was a, a lot of great talent already here. Um, you know, that, and that then developed into, you know, even better athletes. So, um, I think that development coupled with just, you know, um, endless recruiting has just, you know, really helped the program take off. And I, I think there has to be an element of some in-state, talent as well some kids you guys have some some in-state talent in virginia oh yeah um lexi cuomo you know she's from up in the fairfax area nice. um abby harder anna keating were two of our, our freshmen this year um yeah we i mean we we one of our bigger goals has been to try to keep the best kids in virginia in virginia sure. we've got a local kid august lamb he's from charlottesville um you know, he's the one that was dropping 18 sixes this past weekend mm-hmm. on relays at NCAAs. He came in, he was a 20.5 50 freestyler at a high school. Wow. Um, we've got, we've got two more locals um, committed. One will be coming in this fall. One comes in in the class of 22, you know, so we definitely want to, there's, there is an abundance of very talented, great kids in the state of Virginia, um, Richmond, you know, DC areas. There's a lot of great club teams there. So, you know, we do our best try to keep them here. And, you know, sometimes we get them, sometimes we don't, um, you know, we've got some Virginia beach kids coming our way as well. So, you know, if, if we, we would not have to go out of state, if we got all the great, you know, all the, the top 10 kids every year out of the state of Virginia, we, we could build a, pro, a national championship program off that alone. Um, we're, you know, odds of us getting all 10 of them or not, you know, <laughs> we're not going to get all 10 of them, but you know, there's, there's that much talent here, which is really cool. That's nice. That's helpful. And there'll be, there'll be a time very soon when you may have a shot at all 10 of them. That's coming. It's coming quick, <laughs> <laughs> especially if you keep swimming the way you're swimming. Um, listen, you know, j- just on this, we, we saw the news yesterday, this podcast is going to come out, you know, in a few days or whatever, but we saw the news yesterday that Eddie Reese stepped down. Um, what, what's been your interactions with him over the years? You know, Eddie's been a major mentor um, to me. So I, you know, probably, I can't remember if it was the summer of 2014 or 2015, but um, it was, it was about the time our guys in NC state were getting really good. And, and I, we had Ryan held. So Ryan, um, the summer, that summer I took Ryan held, Simonis Billis, Joe Bonk and Soren Dahl. So four of our stud, you know, sprint guys to Austin for a week in the summer. I, I had talked to Eddie at NCAAs. Actually, I had talked to Eddie um, the summer, a year and a half before that summer at, at nationals. And it was nationals was at out in Stanford or junior nationals out at Stanford that summer. And I, I sat with him and talked to him for like an hour in the stands. Like he and I were the only ones there watching, I don't know, some mile heats or something like that. And, and I had mentioned to him, I really want to come out and spend a week um, sometime just to soak in as much knowledge as I could. Um, and a year later he was like, Todd, 
when are you coming out to visit me? Like he mm. remembered. And I, I was blown away. First of all, that he even remembered my name, <laughs> <laughs> um, let alone what we talked about. And so anyway, we went out that summer, I, you know, spent a week there, you know, Conger was there, schooling was there. Mm. Um, you know, obviously they've always had a, an abundance of talent. And so the four guys I brought trained with them, you know, I just stood on deck and hung out with Eddie and just, you know, like I said, soaked up as much knowledge as I could. And really from that point on, you know, I don't know if I, I, I don't know what he would consider it. I would consider it. We're pretty close. I mean, I, maybe he's like that with everybody, but he, you know, he, we would, we probably have talked once a month since then Oh wow. Um, on the phone. I might call him. He might call me, you know, anytime my phone rings and, and Eddie Reese pops up on it, I'm, it's, I'm just like, Oh man, I feel like I'm special because Eddie's calling me <laughs> yeah. um, again. He might, he's probably does that with everybody. That's just the kind of guy he is. So um, I mean, that, that's, you know, that kind of, my relationship with him, my experiences with him. And, you know, I've, I've talked to him a lot about the things that he does at, at Texas and, you know, why he does them and, you know, how does he train this person or that person, or he's given me advice on tapers and, you know, training people and this, you know, all kinds of stuff. Um, you know, he's just been somebody who's always been willing to give up information and share, which is, uh, you know, I think that's one of the reasons why I'm, I probably don't mind giving up information and sharing as well. It's because he's been so forthcoming with a lot of that stuff. Um, but yeah, I mean, he's just full of so much knowledge. Um, yeah. you know, he's just a funny guy. I walked up to him. He's just a nut too. Right. And he just says hilarious things But I walked up to him at NCAAs last week. And I think it was the last final session. And I just happened to walk by him. He was sitting down and he calls me over and he's like, Hey, do you coach soccer? <laughs> I was like, I don't, I do not coach soccer, but I said, yeah, you know, I coach soccer. I got all kinds of tricks. You know, I don't, I was messing around. He's like, well, if you coach soccer, you probably shouldn't be here coaching swimmers. So get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, all right, he's just a nut, you know? Yeah, so, he's awesome. I love yeah. Eddie. He, he's yeah, a good man. I, I'm, you know, I, I don't know why I'm surprised that he retired. You know, I, I probably shouldn't be, but you know, you just kind of never thought you, you, you thought it would never end, you know? Yeah. Yeah, he's a good man, and uh, he's been around for a long time. And I remember competing against him as a as a swimmer, and then as a coach, and um, and and he was the same with me. I, I never took him up on the offer. That's one of my big regrets. Is he he always said, "Brett, come down and spend a week with me," and and I never did. And and it's always been in the back of my mind of like, why didn't I do that? You know, I just just never had the time with family yeah. and my own team and things. It was just like. I never prioritize it. I, there's always time. Don't get me wrong. There's time for anything you want to make time yeah, for. Yeah. But I just never prioritize. And, and, I, and I'm bummed about that. I wish I had. So you, you had a great experience there. Um, you know, people are going to throw names around and all sorts of stuff. You're just, you're coming off a national championship, so you don't need to go anywhere. But I mean, is there any, is there any um, draw to wanting to go and be the head coach at Texas? I mean, you know, I don't know. I don't know that there's any coach in their right mind who wouldn't be at some level interested in that. Right. Because it's Texas. They've been the best forever. They are the best. They're probably going to continue to be the best. So, you know, I would say if you asked me that five years ago, I'd have been like, yeah, I'm gone. I'm gone. You know, yeah. if I, if I was offered it five years ago, there wouldn't be any question. Yeah. Um, you know, I actually was just talking to um, one of my old buddies that I worked with a strength coach that I used to work with earlier today. He asked me the same thing. And I was like, I don't know. We just won. <laughs> Yeah, I know. That's what I'm saying. Uh, I mean, I don't, you know, so, um, you know, I, I can, all I can say is, is that things here have never been better. You know, the administration is unreal to me and to our staff and to the program. And, um, you know, for me, you know, I, I mentioned this earlier, right. That per, I have personal goals. Right. And sure. I think everybody should have goals, right. If you wake up without goals every day, what, like, what are you doing? Like, where yeah. are you headed? What are sure. you doing with your life? And so, um, you know, my goals are to, you know, as a coach, I want to coach athletes that can win national championships. Okay. I want to be a part of a program that can win national championships. And, you know, I want to be able to coach, you know, potential Olympians and people that can contend for Olympic spots and hopefully, you know, earn Olympic spots. And so, you know, those are the things that, you know, we're doing here and we can do here. And so, you know, I think there's just a lot more that can be done here. Um, and honestly, I've modeled a lot of my, the met what we, the way that we are building our men's program around what Eddie has done at Texas. Sure. Um, and so I, I, uh, I do believe that our men's program can get to that level too. Um, interestingly enough, speaking of Eddie, 
he told me we, we were talked earlier this year, maybe January, December, February, I can't remember. It was before championship season. And we were talking, he was talking about our men and our women. And he was like, yeah, you guys are in a good place to, to you know, potentially win the national championship for the women, this and that and the other. And, you know, he, he said to me, the one thing he said to me really stuck out. He's like, well, he's like, it takes about eight years to, to really develop a really good men's program. Yeah. And so I'm thinking, it, and, but interestingly enough, he said it takes probably four years to develop a really good women's program, but it takes twice as long, eight years to develop a men's program. And so I'm thinking, all right, well, we're four years in and we might win a national championship on the, on the women's side and we're halfway to eight years on the men. And so, you know, I, I think also when I first took the job here, I kind of formulated a, you know, a long-term plan, but, you know, I don't know, five years is long-term, but five years and 10 years. And um, the, the plan was for the women to be contending in five years and the men to be contending in 10 years. So when Eddie said eight years, I was like, Oh, I guess, you know, I'm kind of, mm-hmm. kind of right on that. So yeah. anyway, you know, I, I think that every coach in the country probably had a thought of, Oh man, that would be a great job. Um, but you know, I don't think every coach in the country isn't here and, and didn't just do what our, what our women and what our men just did. So it was, it was a lot of fun. Well, listen, mate, you're in a good spot and you're doing amazing things. And obviously you're recruiting well and people are interested and, and look, you're getting results. One thing that Texas has is Texas money. So go and ask for a raise, (laughs) get a raise at least. (laughs) Ah, it's all good, man. It's all good. Now you're doing well. Listen, man, congrats. Um, just want to chat with you. I'm a, I'm a fan from afar and loving what you're doing and, um, keep it going, man. It's, it's awesome stuff to see. Appreciate it, man. Good talking to you. Yeah. Thanks for coming on. Take care. eh? Of course. Yeah. Thanks. See you, Todd.